since 1945. I'll stop there for a minute and just remind you about them. Because each one, successfully, was more devious than their predecessors over nuclear weapons. Gates School, with his cunning and willful lies about the unilateralist position of the 1960 conference, and his anti-democratic cheating at the 1961 conference, allowing unions to vote both ways. Wilson, going against his firm 1964 pre-election pledge to convert Polaris into non-nuclear weapons, or else cancel the program altogether, and then the following year, ordering four of them, the renowned, the repulse, I love these names, the revenge, and the revolution. And when Polaris became obsolescent in 1966, it was Wilson who immediately replaced it with Poseidon. Also famously remembered, of course, uh, as an incident in 1964, and I don't think there's ever been any other incident like it, when he expelled Michael Foote from the party for voting against the Tory defence estimates. I don't think that's ever been done in politics. And then, of course, there's Callaghan, Uncle Jim, conceding from Parliament the biggest ever undeclared expenditure in the Chevalier programme to update Polaris, a sum of £1 billion not revealed until Francis Pym came to power and revealed it in 1980. And this is where a defence spokesman told the truth. Ready for it? Asked if they were intending to spend four to six hundred million pounds on the update of Polaris, he quite correctly said no, because of course it was a billion pounds. <laughs> It's the best I could come up with. <laughs> and this, <clears throat> all of these things, there's more and more in each, each one of these leaders' regimes. More and more and more. It goes on and on and on. And by the way, for those of you who need to know, a Chevaline is a French mountain goat capable of death-defying flying leaps. But, finally about Callaghan, believe it or not, it was not Mrs. Thatcher who organised Trident. The first meetings about Trident were when good old Uncle Jim approached in secret President Carter and virtually arranged for that missile to come at the Guadalupe summit. Now, I always try to be fair. I've tried to be fair to Atlee. I have to say, of all, the, of all the Prime Ministers uh, ever, of all of these Ministers ever, uh, of all of the people I've been to, well, I've described a couple of more first before I say that. I want to see this book. I don't recommend it unless you want to fall asleep. It's the Autobiography of James Callaghan. And I thought, to be fair, I'd just look up what he had to say about the Chevalier incident. Well, not to be fair. Uh, Chevalier. Not in there. <laughs> Would you believe it? It's not in there. This great big fat book and Chevalier is not mentioned once. And then dear old Michael thought, well, he wasn't the leader for long. But how can we ever forget his cringe-making support for the Falklands War? How can we ever forget that? Or forgive him? And lastly, my pet hate, the odious hypocrite, Kinnock. This is, Kinnock, listen to this. Going for a parliamentary nomination in 1969, he remarked to one of his supporters, Terry Burns, I'll be glad when it's all over and I can put my CND badge back on. Do you remember all the phony promises he made when he was leader of the Labour Party? How many of you remember his shadow minister of defence, Martin O'Neill? How many would recognise him if he passed you in the street today? This is what their astonishing document said. 
One, the elimination of all American bases. Two, a non-nuclear defense policy. Three, a non-nuclear Europe. Four, a reduction in private arms sales. This from the party who'd, who'd introduced the first political super arms salesman in Dennis Haley. No participation in Star Wars. And best of all, are you ready for this? Best of all, our aim is the complete global nuclear disarmament by the year 2000. Oh, come on. And all this from a man who was scared to wear his CND badge for a nomination interview. Damn it, I wore mine when I was interviewed to join the party. And I still got in. <laughs> Please forgive me, but what a load of old books. Honestly. Anyway, as I was saying before I interrupted myself two or three times, of all the Labour leaders, Attlee might just be the one, because he was so stitched up, for whom, if I was in an exceptionally benign mood, and very drunk, <laughs> I might, in spite of what we've heard, feel a subatomic twinge of sympathy. If only it never said anything. Here are some, I'm going to end now. Here are some more words from Atlee. 1955. The fact that we do possess these weapons does have an effect. It is quite an illusion to think that it does not have an effect. 1964. After a most refreshing change of heart. If a man had any personality, he could put across British foreign policy without a nuclear bomb in his hand. As some of you may know, a couple of weeks ago the BBC paid homage to Beethoven by playing every piece of music he ever wrote in a week. Bad luck if you missed it. A shame if you've never listened to Beethoven. Not only a great composer, but a truly remarkable man. Someone who is really worth talking about, and I wish I could spend time talking about him. And he too was betrayed by politics. Thank goodness it wasn't Ackley Week, where every one of his speeches was fed to us every day for a week, all day. Well... I think we've had enough of Attlee and the rest of all of his friends, the People's Party with their fine weasel words, their forked tongues that betrayed every hope decent human beings had to live in a peaceful world. So instead, I shall finish with some splendid words written about my great hero Beethoven. And some of you may have heard me use them before, and I'll be glad that I'm telling you them again. Listen to these words. Masterpieces of art are instilled with a surplus, renewable energy. An energy that provides a motive force for the change in relations between human beings. Because they contain projections of human desires and goals which have not yet been achieved. Beethoven's last piano sonata is a monument to his conviction that solutions to the problems facing humanity lie ever within our grasp if they can be recognized for what they are. Good old Beethoven, we couldn't have put that better ourselves.